I'm not a huge fan of river tables, but in this video, I'm going to try and change that because maybe there's just something wrong with me. I have this pretty ugly slab of maple laying around and I wanna to try to turn it into a unique piece of furniture. So let's get started. I bought this slab probably about three months ago for 150 bucks and just kind of had it sitting around not really knowing what to do with it. You can see all those gray and brown streaks in the wood and that is actually caused by ambrosia beetles. The streaks are formed by pregnant beetles boring their way into the tree. They do this to deposit their larvae and when they do that they actually carry a fungi on their foot which ultimately causes that gray and brown streaking in the tree. Some people hate it and some people really like it. I think it's a really unique kind of figure that you really don't find in any other type of wood. Here I am cutting a square edge on both sides of the slab. I originally wanted to keep this one as just kind of a big slab coffee table but you'll see shortly why I ended up deciding to change my mind. So I hopped up on my table and I just kind of started looking at it. I thought that it was just too short and fat. Not that there's anything wrong with being short and fat, but I just wasn't digging the ratio of it. At this point, I really didn't know what to do with the slab. When I have to think hard on something, I find myself just taking hot laps around the shop. I've probably done hundreds of, of laps just thinking and procrastinating, but I guess at least I'm getting my steps in. I really didn't want to cut the slab in half, but it had a pretty decent crack in the middle, and eventually I said screw it and just cut that thing right down the middle. In one of my recent videos, I made a comment saying how I wasn't a huge fan of epoxy and how I kind of think it's being overused and there were some people that weren't very happy with that comment, which I completely understand. I did use a little bit of epoxy in that build, so for those people, I decided that I'm not going to use a single drop of epoxy in this build. Now, how do you like that? I personally think this wood has enough character and figure to begin with, so adding epoxy would just subtract from the wood at that point. I wanted to try and do a river table, but almost as if the river has dried out and there's no more water or epoxy left, just like the dying trend of epoxy river tables. Now that'll stir the pot. So I decided to fill all the wormholes with clear CA glue. I did a test piece between black and clear and I found that clear just looks a bit more natural so that's what I went with. This was easy enough and I could just come back with my sander to smooth everything out. Once that was done I could put the slabs aside and start on the base. You can see I was pretty excited or just had a good song playing here. Anyways, since I decided to cut the slab in half I had to change my original design for the base up a bit. I wanted to keep that center live edge area open, so I designed a base that would allow for that. If you've watched a few of my videos already, you may have started to notice that I used blackened oak a lot, and that's for two really main reasons. The first being is that I just love the way it looks and it matches almost everything. And the second being I just have a ton of oak I had milled up, so I might as well use it, right? My live edge lovers might want to look away here, but I had to break down this oak into manageable pieces in order to make the panel for the legs. This panel will be a little bit different than a normal panel since the leg design is wider than it is tall. The grain will run in the opposite direction of what it usually would run. What I mean here is that usually the grain of the panel would run along the length of the panel, but in this case, it's running parallel with the width. Kind of confusing, I know, but it will make sense the more I go along. Once I got all the pieces ready, I can get some glue on there and get the panels glued up. The next day, I flattened them with my drum sander since they would be a bit too wide for my planer. Some people say that drum sanders shouldn't be used as planers, but it worked good enough for me. Next, I took my track saw to make a square reference edge that I could then cut the other side on the table saw to make it parallel.
Next, I had to whip up some templates to accurately make the two curves in the legs. I used my circle jig and my router to make both of those curved pieces. I actually almost had to use a math equation I learned from high school to figure out the right radius I needed, but my savior was an online calculator that did all the hard work for me. Sorry, math teacher. Once I got the profile traced out, it was as simple as following the line with my jigsaw. A bandsaw would have been much easier here, but my little bandsaw that I have would have quivered at the thought of being able to cut two inch thick oak. Jigsaws are best used when going slow and steady since the blade can kind of deflect when cutting at a faster pace. You can see here I accidentally cut into my workbench here because I wasn't really paying attention to what I was doing and I wasn't really too amused about it. Anyways, once I got over myself, I grabbed those templates I made earlier and some CA glue and blue tape to attach them to the legs. Now, if there's any tool in this build that I would give the MVP award to, it would definitely have to be this template bit that I got just for this build. And man, I couldn't believe how many times I used it in this build, and I also couldn't believe what I was missing on the whole time without this bit. It made routing out these profiles so easy, and it really did a great job. The only thing I don't like about it is I had to make multiple passes since it was a smaller bit, so I might get some larger ones in the future. After I get all the wood crumbs swept up, I can just use a flush trim bit to get rid of the rest of the waste I left on there. This is definitely a satisfying bit to use, and the great thing about it is you pretty much almost can't mess it up either. You just have to make sure the bit is set at the right height on the router table, and you're pretty much good to go. And look at that! This base is actually starting to look like something. <laughs> Anyways, after that, I could replace that tiny bit with a much larger three quarter of an inch round over bit. I thought a bigger round over would kind of look nice with these big swooping curves on the base. And for once, I was definitely happy with my decision to do a big round over. I took multiple passes on each side and went as slow as I could just to avoid any possible tear out. Next, I'll move on to the centerpiece that will kind of hold both of the legs together. I thought a good name for this piece would be the crumb catcher, since it will be right underneath the opening in the top of the table where all the crumbs will probably end up falling down. I had to make sure to get a perfect round over for the way I'm going to attach this to the base. I thought of many different ways I could attach this, but I wanted the table to be collapsible, but without sacrificing its durability and strength. So here's what I came up with. I'm making a template that will allow me to route a mortise into the center of the leg that will accept this piece. I want it to be a tight fit, but not too tight to where I can't easily fit it in. You know, just right. I'm not sure if this is the best way to do it, but I figured I would just try it and see how strong it was. I could use the template bit again to ride right along that template I made and give me a perfect match of the profile I routed on the crumb catcher board. I had to make multiple passes, but eventually I had an inch deep mortise that hopefully would fit the other board. Once I did a little test fit, I was actually surprised how well it fit in there. I took a rubber mallet and could go ahead and just tap it in. So like I said before, I wanted to be able to break this table down, maybe just in case I needed to ship it somewhere or just transport it easier. So I'm not going to be using any glue in this joint. I know for a fact there are going to be some people out there who will say or think that it's not going to be strong enough, but I can promise you it's surprisingly strong, and once I get it fastened to the top, you probably are not going to be even know I didn't use glue. 
After that, I can fill the small knot hole with some black CA glue to get the base ready to be stained. Since I'm using a water-based stain, I raise the grain first with a little bit of water. This helps the surface to be much smoother after I apply the stain since the grain will be already raised. The stain I'm using for this project is this General Finishes Black Wood Stain, and this is my go-to. I've said this many of times, but I've tried many different ways to get a jet black stain on oak, and this does the best job by far that I've found. The other great thing about it is that you can just apply it, let it dry, and you're pretty much good to go. You don't have to worry about wiping it off or anything else. As always, I'll leave a link to this product as well as all the other tools I like to use. Once I got every piece covered in black, I had to figure out how to attach the top to the base while still holding it down securely to the base. I decided to cut out these thinner pieces of oak to act like steel mounting plates that I've kind of used before. I really just wanted to see if a piece of oak like this would work just as well as the steel. I pre-drilled each hole and attached them to the top of the leg. I use three decking screws just to make sure I get a really secure bond. Now I could have used threaded inserts and bolts here, but I didn't really think it was necessary and figured the deck screws might even do a better job of holding the plate to that end grain. Next I can go ahead and get the top laid out to cut the recesses for the oak plates. I made sure to get equal measurements the whole way around the top. I decided to leave about a 2-3 to three inch gap between the two live edge pieces for the top. I could have went a little wider, but I thought that distance was the most aesthetically pleasing, so that's what I went with. To make the recesses for the plates, I broke out the MVP again. I made a quick template and used the template bit in my router to make pretty easy work of all the recesses. So for this table build in particular, I didn't really have much of a plan in mind. This is honestly not how I usually work. I at least spend a good amount of time making sure that my next project is kind of just broadly planned out and will end up hopefully looking like a nice piece of furniture. That was not the case for this build and I have to say it was pretty refreshing. Just winging it and hoping for the best. I thought this table would either look like a really complex and unique kind of piece of furniture or just a failed attempt at trying to be different. But at this point, I was actually getting really excited and thinking that it could actually be a pretty cool table, which is always a good feeling. For the top, I used threaded inserts and I realized I will never hand wind one of these things in again. These suckers were extremely tight and since I had like 10 of these sized allen wrenches sitting around, I just cut one of the curves off with a saw and chucked it up in my drill. And man, I could not believe what I was missing. This was so much easier than hand winding them in and I was so glad I had decided to do this. Anyways, I got these new to me bolts that had a countersink head so I could get them flush with the plate. So that's exactly what I did. I was a little worried that they might not have as much holding power as say a bolt with a flat head and a washer. But once I got them all attached, I really could not tell a difference. Once each bolt was attached, I could finally flip this thing over and see what it was going to look like. It was definitely much heavier than I thought it was going to be, but with a little bit of willpower, I eventually got it flipped over. I was genuinely curious how sturdy this table would be because it's not the most structurally sound design of furniture I've ever made, but after some extremely scientific tests, I discovered that it's really sturdy and there better not be a single comment telling me that it's not. So after that, I decided to wait to trim both ends of the top until I had it attached just to make sure they would both be the exact same length and square on both sides. This was easy enough to trim it up with my track saw, which made pretty quick work of it. Once 
Once I got it back on the bench, I could take the top back off and route the edge profile. I chose to go with a roundover again to match the base. Now, since Blacktail Studio has his own kind of signature table profile, which is his 22 degree chamfer, I decided I kind of want my own signature table profile, which I'm calling the pillowing profile. Now, trust me, I'm fully aware that I'm not at the level that the father of woodworking YouTube is at, nor did I invent this profile, but I do plan to use this profile more in the future, so I'm just going to go ahead and unofficially claim it now. After that, there was this small little bark inclusion that I just filled with some CA glue. Then I could go ahead and start the sanding process. I got this new 6 inch 3M sander and man is it epic. I started at 80 grit and only went up to 180 due to the finish that I'm going to apply. Once I raised the grain with water, I could go ahead, wipe everything down, re-sand and get ready for finish. I decided to go with this satin water-based poly acrylic. I chose a water-based finish because maple tends to turn kind of an ugly yellowish color with an oil-based finish and a water-based finish helps prevent that. I ended up actually applying four layers of finish just to make sure I got a good thick layer of protection on the top. Luckily, water-based finish dries much quicker than oil-based, so I could apply more layers about an every half an hour. After 24 full hours, though, I came back and began sanding the finish. I wanted to get it up to like a glass-like appearance, so I sanded all the way up to 3000 grit. This was very tedious, but I really think it paid off in the end. I made sure to take my time with this finish because it's honestly what makes or breaks the whole project. I had to be even more careful on the edges to make sure I didn't sand through the finish in any spot. You can see the pretty high sheen I have worked up and I have to say, I think this is my best finish job yet. I'm super proud of how it turned out and I will admit that I am one to want to rush through the finishing project just because I'm so excited to get it done. But this time I made sure to take all the time I needed to get it perfect and honestly it was worth it in the end. I used some Ribio Monocoat to kind of act as a wax and this really brings the whole finish to life. I was actually surprised with how much curl is in this maple slab and this coat of Rubio made the slab look almost 3D. The extra layer of finish should just help make this top that much more durable. Once I got the top complete, I could put a quick coat of finish on the base as well. Some people may think that the black stain acts as a finish, but it only just colors the wood and really provides no extra protection. So again, I'm using Rubio Monaco to finish the black and oak as I personally think it makes for a perfect matte finish. For those that don't know, Rubio Monaco is a hard wax finish. It's different than most finishes because you actually buff it all off after it soaks into the wood for about 15 minutes. This makes it one of the easiest finishes to apply, but it's definitely going to make your wallet a bit lighter. Once I let the finish dry for about two days, I could reassemble this thing. I forgot to show it, but I actually dyed the mounting plates black as well. Not that it really matters and no one will barely ever see it, but I figured it would just kind of match the legs better. And after that, this table is complete. I have to say, I'm honestly proud of this one. I understand it's not going to be everyone's piece of cake, but I really enjoyed how different it is. I'm obviously curious to know what you think of it. Was it a waste of time since I didn't put a blue river down the middle? Or do you like the gap in the middle? Let me know down below. As always, thank you for spending your valuable time with me. And subscribe so you can spend more time with me in the future. I'll see you in the next one.